Hey, welcome back everyone. Hope you all had a really great long weekend. So today we're going to continue our discussion of probability review. So we're going to actually going to finish it in the first few minutes, hopefully. And then we're going to be talking about um, the probabilistic models in machine learning. So starting with the probabilistic linear models. So last time we focused a lot on Gaussian distributions. Um, we drew some pictures to interpret the distributions geometrically using the eigendecomposition of the covariance matrix. Um, and then we talked about some uh, a few different transformations of Gaussian random variables. And finally, we introduced block notation and the marginalization of jointly Gaussian variables. So um, that was here. Basically, if x can be written in block form as S, x a and x b, then we can also form the same blocks um, with the mean and the covariance matrix. So then marginali marginalizing um, the distribution becomes very easy. So remember, marginalizing, uh, marginalizing usually involves adding up all the values across one of the dimensions. In this case, integrating them. So because the normal distribution is actually kind of complicated in the functional form, um, it has some exponential. This integral can be very hard to compute. But in the case of Gaussian distributions, this is actually really easy. You simply read it off. So for example, the xA block would have a mean of mu a. That's the first part of the overall mean vector. And then the covariance would simply be the upper left block of the covariance matrix of x. Um, similar story for xB. Okay, so that's a really nice property of Gaussian random variables. Um, another one is called marginalization sorry, uh, conditioning. So this one is conditioning. So that means that we're given some joint distribution shown by the surface. And then suppose we condition on a value of one of the variables. That means pictorially that we're looking at one slice uh, of this two dimensional picture. So let's say this slice, the slice depends on what variable you're given and the value that you're given. So when we take the slice, we get another, we get, it turns out that we also get another bell curve. So we get another uh, normal distribution. Um, it looks very, it looks very short in this case. So then we normalize it so that the area adds up to one. So this process is normally not so easy, um, but for Gaussian random variables, it's pretty easy. Again, we express X, the vector in block form, XA and XB. Um, remember, xA and xB could have any number of components. So now we write down the mean and the covariance in block form again. And uh, so now we can, once we have that, we have a closed form expression for the conditional distribution of xA given xB as well as xB given xA. So for xA given xB, we actually have that the new mean is mu a plus sigma a b times sigma b b inverse times x b minus mu b. Okay, so that's the so we're not going to derive this, but this is actually a very famous result. Uh, it's used a lot. Um, for example, if you guys have studied Kalman filters, this uh, this is used quite a bit, and same with the covariance. So the conditional covariance is actually sigma a a minus sigma a b sigma bb inverse, and then sigma ba. Okay, and then for xb given xa is the same thing. You just swap all the indices uh, a with b. Okay, so basically um, for Gaussian random variables, we get the mean and the covariance. Uh, we get a conditional mean and conditional covariance kind of in closed form. And the interpretation is basically this picture here. Okay, so that's actually a lot of stuff about Gaussian random variables. So please take a few minutes to look at this. So which one of the following must be a Gaussian random variable? Okay, take uh, maybe, I think there are a lot of choices here, so three minutes. <laughs> 
Okay, let's take a look. Okay, A, yes. So if we're given that X and Y are jointly distributed as a normal distribution of zero mean and identity covariance, then X given Y equal to one would actually be a Gaussian random variable. So that's actually from the previous slide, right? So if we condition on one of the blocks, then we still obtain a, a Gaussian random variable with some mean and some covariance given by these formulas. So A is actually, yes, must be a Gaussian random variable. Um, so B is very similar, right? So we have uh, two variables basically written in block form. So now Y given X equals 100, that must be a Gaussian random variable. Okay, C, so in C, we're given X and Y uh, are blocks of some Gaussian random variable. And then, uh, so what's one half X minus one third Y? So that turns out to be a linear transformation of X, Y. So, and we know that uh, linear transformations, that means multiplying by A, so if a vector X is Gaussian, then multiplying by A will keep it Gaussian with a different mean and covariance. So C is yes. Okay, so if you don't see why, um, this is the linear transformation, we can actually, uh, it, it's because we can actually write one half X minus one third Y. This can be written as A matrix times this vector and the matrix is actually just going to be one half zero zero minus one third right so this is a linear transformation okay so D so D were given that X and Y are jointly Gaussian um, so then X must be Gaussian because we just talked about the marginalization over here, right? So if you have a block, if you write down a, a vector as a block and the entire vector is Gaussian, then each block is also a Gaussian, right? So that's why X is a Gaussian. So now we're just multiplying by 10 minus 10 and then adding a constant. So um, all that does is change the variance and the mean, but the overall variable here, minus 10 X plus five, that's still Gaussian. Okay, so E, uh, so for E, this is a little different. Previously, we have always been given that X and Y are jointly Gaussian, but now X and Y are individually Gaussian and X is independent of Y. So, so actually that's good. We really need this independence condition. So if X is in independent of Y, that means that Y is also independent of minus 10 X. So then using the property that if we have two independent Gaussian variables, their sum is also Gaussian. So we have that, yes, uh, for this choice, E, uh, Y minus 10 X is Gaussian. Okay, I'm gonna skip these two for now. Um, jumping to the last one. So here we have X and Y are individually Gaussian, and then we're given some covariance of X and Y. Um, actually, well, Y doesn't even appear here, so we don't really care about Y and or the covariance. Um, we just know that, okay, X is Gaussian, so multiplying by a constant, adding a constant, that, um, that means that our overall variable, minus 10X plus five, that's still Gaussian. Okay. So next, we're actually gonna look at G. The answer to G is no, this is not necessarily a Gaussian random variable. So here, we're actually given that X and Y are individually Gaussian, so they may not be jointly Gaussian. If they were jointly Gaussian, then X minus Y would be Gaussian because that would just be a linear transformation. Um, but uh, actually, the jointly Gaussian condition is the key here. If two Gaussian random variables are not, uh, if two variables are Gaussian, but not necessarily jointly Gaussian, and in this case, they're not independent because they have some covariance, um, a linear combination of them may not be Gaussian in general. 
So that's why the answer to G is no. Okay, so finally that brings us to F. So F looks exactly like G, except that we are given a covariance of minus one. Interestingly, this is kind of a trick question, but interestingly, that turns F into a yes. So X minus Y in this case is actually a Gaussian. Okay, so this one actually requires a bit of work. So, so let's do that. Okay, so okay, there we go. So here we're looking at uh, the random variable y, sorry, x minus y, right? Where, where x is normally distributed with uh, mean of zero, variance of one, y is also me, uh, Gaussian random variable with mean zero, variance one. And then we're given covariance of x, y equals to negative one. Okay, so, so it turns out that in this particular case, a covariance of minus one actually means that the two variables have a correlation of minus one as well. So remember the definition of correlation? So the correlation So correlation is usually denoted rho of x, y. So that equals to covariance of x, y divided by square root or variance of x times square root variance of y. In this case, we have a covariance of minus one and then for both x and y, the variance is one. So we basically just have one times one in the denominator. So that actually gives us minus one. So when correlation is actually minus one, that actually implies that X equals minus Y. So that means our original random variable X minus Y, this is actually equal to minus two Y. And minus two y, well, because y is normally distributed, so y is Gaussian, so minus two y must be Gaussian, right? So that's why the answer to the last, uh, I guess, not the last one, but the one that we're going over, part f, that one turns out to be yes. But it's kind of a trick question where we, you have to realize that the covariance of x y being minus one actually means that the correlation is minus one, and that means that x equals minus y. All right, so it's a few steps of logic to arrive at the answer. But uh, in the most general case, if, you, if it's not a special case like this, then um, two individually Gaussian variables, not necessarily joint Gaussian, um, their sum or a linear combination of them may not be Gaussian. Okay, before we wrap up the um, probability review, I just wanted to quickly uh, to quickly show why a correlation of minus one means that uh, x equals minus y. So again, this requires a bit of work, so let's let's work it work it out. Okay, so for uh, for this, let's let's assume let's just assume that um, well our variables have zero means and unit variance, right? So that's a, so that's kind of the case. So let's assume that x, y have zero mean and then unit variance. So unit variance means that the variance is equal to one. Okay. So now we're gonna do a bit of math. Um, so for now, maybe the math, maybe it's unclear why we're doing this, but let's just uh, bear with me. So let's compute, let's compute expected value of x minus rho y. So rho, uh, so rho is the correlation. Okay, so previously we said rho x y, so I guess we can put it down here as well. Okay, so actually do that squared, 
So if we expand this out, we're going to get expectation of x squared. And then we have a minus um, 2 rho expectation of xy. And then plus rho squared of expectation of y squared. Okay. So we're going to simplify a little bit. So, so because x is 0 mean, that means that x, expectation of x squared is already the variance of x. So this is 1. Uh, normally, the variance of x is expected value of x squared minus expected value of x, all of that squared, right? So, But now e of x, where expected value of x is 0. So this whole thing um, is just a... Um, it's just a variance of x. So we, we assume that the variance would be 1. Okay, so we, maybe we can write this down. So variance of x is normally expected x squared minus expected value of x, all, all that squared. Right In this case, this that's 0 because we assume 0 mean. So then in the end, uh, we just have e of x squared equals to the, the variance, and that's also equal to 1. So that's why we have a 1 here. right? Same story with the y. So at the end, I guess we're just going to have a plus rho squared here. Um, OK, so now we, we have to work on the middle term. So, so covariance. So for the middle term, uh, note that covariance of x and y is usually e of x, y. Uh, minus e of x, e of y. Okay, and ag again, e of x and e of y are both zero, so then that term is zero. So the covariance is actually just e of x, y. And as we have seen um, above here, we are, because we also assume that variance of x and variance of y are one, this is also equal to the correlation as well in, in our case right so so over here we simply have two rho xy and then e of xy is the same as rho of xy so then we have a squared here so if we simplify a little bit we get one minus rho squared okay So, so the other thing to note is that the expected value here, the expression inside is a square, and a square is never negative. So this thing is always greater than or equal to zero. So this random variable that we're taking the expectation of, that's never negative, right? So, so that means its expectation must also never be negative. So that means finally one minus rho squared must never be negative. Um, I guess I'm making this observation just to say that, okay, it looks like rho must be between minus one and one, which which is what we said about the correlation. So I guess this kind of shows that um, the correlation must be between minus one and one. Okay, so now uh, one more step and we can show the result we want. So now what happens if rho of x, y equals to minus 1, which is what we had in our previous example. Then, well, then we plug it in and we get that the expectation that we calculated. So, so hopefully now you see why we calculated this exp expectation, because it's pretty useful in the end, right? But in, in the beginning, it wasn't so obvious. Um, okay. But if uh, if rho if rho x y is equal to minus one, then plugging it in here, we get that the expectation of x minus rho y squared is equal to zero. But we also know that x minus rho y squared is never is never negative, right? So how can you have a non-negative random variable whose expectation is zero? Well, the only way for that to happen is if the inside is always equal to zero. That is the only way. 
for the expectation of this squared expression to be equal to zero. So that actually implies that x equals rho uh, y, right? Actually, in our case, because we assume that uh, rho is minus one, so this is just minus y, right? So that kind of shows that when the correlation is negative one, um, x equals to minus y. Uh, on the other hand, we can also show that, of course, if rho xy is equal to one, then this would also mean that uh, x equals to y. Okay, but uh, that wasn't needed for the question, but I thought I would say that anyway. It's a pretty simple result after doing all this work. Okay, so this kind of an aside on um, kind of on part G, uh, part F, right? So this is a kind of a trick question, but I wanted to use that so that so that I, so that I can show you a little bit about the basics of correlation. And finally, with the probability review out of the way, we can now revisit linear regression um, from a probabilistic perspective. Okay, so first we are going to discuss uh, we're going we're gonna to discuss probabilistic models. So suppose we know how the data was generated. So this is known as the data generating process. So we have seen a bit of this in the coding example that we did, um, where we we were the ones that actually generated some polynomial data with some noise, right? So so suppose we know how the data is generated. Well, let's say that we're going to use this. Um, let's just say that we're going to use this uh, model to generate data. So y equals w transpose x plus sigma epsilon. So epsilon is just a Gaussian variable with mean of zero and variance of one. And then w, as usual, is our unknown parameter. And then sigma, which is the amount of noise, is also unknown. Of course, in general, we wouldn't necessarily know how the data was generated, but we can always construct models of what, how we think the data was generated. And then given the model that we picked, we can find the best parameters for that model. Okay, so now that we have our model, we're going to observe some data points. Um, the data points come as pairs or tuples of x and y. Um, of course, with many data points, we're going to denote them as x i y i for the i data point. And then we have data points one up to big N. So this set of data points, we're going to be using a script D to denote that. And so, so, we're, so seeing, this, uh, seeing this data, we're, we're kind of assuming that it's generated from this, um, from this model in, a, in an IID way. So IID means independent and identically distributed. So that means that each data point is independent of all of the other data points and they also have the same distribution as all of the other data points. So given our model and the data that we're seeing, we would like to estimate the w, the unknown parameters. Okay, so sigma is also an unknown parameter, but uh, we don't really care that much about it. Um, so we'll get to that in a bit. Okay, so in general, a probabilistic model assigns a probability to every possible observation. So, yeah, so ideally, we choose a probabilistic model based on what we know about the data generation generating process. Um, so in, in this case, I guess this is what we assumed the data generating process to be. So that's also our probabilistic model. So now we can put our knowledge about Gaussian random variables to use. Um, we know that epsilon is normally distributed with uh, mean zero and variance one. That means that when we multiply by sigma, which is not random, it's a deterministic variable, um, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get a variance of sigma squared. And then if we add W transpose X, which is also not a random quantity, in fact, it's just some scalar, um, that means that we're going to get a normal distribution with a mean of W transpose X. Uh, 
So basically, given x, w, and sigma, the probability distribution of y would be a Gaussian distribution with mean w transpose x and variance sigma squared. So now, um, we can write down the actually the probability density function for p of y given x, w, sigma. And that's basically just plugging things into the Gaussian random variable PDF. Um, in our case, it looks like this. So 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared, exponential of negative y minus the mean, w transpose x, all squared, and then divided by 2 times the variance sigma. So we can kind of see how the probabilist, probabilist model assigns a probability for every observation. So given some input data x, if we see some output corresponding output y, our model will tell us that, okay, this is actually the probability density for that particular y. And if you consider a range of y, um, we can actually integrate between that range to obtain the probability that our output data um, lies within some range given our probabilistic model. Okay, so that's the idea of probabilistic models. Um, again, we should keep track of what is given and what is unknown. X and Y are going to be given, and then W and Sigma will be the unknowns. And if we just want to make predictions, we, right, we just care about W, right? Because the, the model is Y equals W transpose X, and then this is just noise. We can always generate more noise. But we, what we really need to determine is this W, so we can make predictions. So in general, the parameters we care about are known as parameters of interest. And then the ones that we don't care about are known as the nuisance parameters. So W is the parameter of interest for us. And then Sigma is a nuisance parameter. Okay, so that brings us to maximum likelihood estimation, which is a method that will allow us to find the best W given our probabilistic model. So this is gonna be a bit of work, so let's work it out uh, slowly. Okay. So we're going to define this uh, quantity, sorry. Okay, I'm not sure why that happens. Okay, let's try. Okay, maybe we'll just start here. So we're going to define the probability of observing the data given our parameters, unknown parameters. We're going to define this quantity to be probability of y1, so observing y1, y2, all the way up to yn, so basically observing all of the outputs in our data, given all of the inputs x1, x2, all the way to xn, and our unknown parameters. Okay. Because of the IID assumption, we can actually write this, we can actually split this as y1 given x1 and the parameters times y2 given x2 and the parameters all the way to probability of yn given xn and the parameters. Okay, so this is from the IID assumption. Okay, we can also write this as the using the product form. So just the big pi of i equal to one to n, uh, probability 
of yi given x, i, w, and sigma. Okay, and furthermore, we act because we have a because we assumed in our model we assumed Gaussian noise. Um, we can actually write down the PDF of all of these conditional distributions. So that's actually just going to be the PDF of the Gaussian random variable. So again, root two pi sigma squared. So exponential of let's make sure I get this right minus y i so the mean so y i is the variable of the distribution the mean is w transpose x i okay you gotta square all of that and then divide it by 2 sigma squared okay so so we're gonna call this so the likelihood function. So the likelihood of W and sigma given our data. Okay. Or, yeah, I guess more simply, we can write the likelihood of W and sigma given the data. Okay, so this is this is basically to emphasize that the uh, the unknowns that we're trying to determine, or the unknown parameters are w and sigma. Actually, we're just determining we're just looking for w here. Um, basically, um, we have a lot of data x i y i, which is going to be fixed once we're given the data. Now we're free to kind of choose in our model what w should be. Depending on the W we choose, we're going to get a different probability that we can calculate using this expression. And what maximum likelihood is going to do is we want to choose the W such that this probability is maximized, right? This probability is called the likelihood function. So when we do maximum likelihood, we want to find the parameters w such that the likelihood function is maximized. Okay, and that is done by choosing w. Okay, so that's the same thing again on the slides. We define p of d given w sigma to be this conditional distribution. All the outputs given all the inputs that we observe and the, the, and the unknown parameters. Um, so if you want to do it very carefully, you can actually split the IID condition on two lines, but I, I just skipped it right, right to this one. And then you plug in P of Y, you plug in the expression for P of YI given XI W sigma, which was on the previous slide. Okay, and then we define this, the likelihood function, emphasizing that the unknowns are W and sigma. And depending on what W we pick, this quantity will be different and we want to pick we want to pick the w that maximizes the likelihood function okay so how do you maximize some function well previously we were minimizing some function but maximizing is kind of the same thing right um, we still want to take the derivative and set it to zero Okay, so we would, like to, we would like to find the optimal parameters. So I'm gonna call, because I'm gonna call it WMLE. MLE stands for maximum likelihood. So this is gonna be the arg max over W of our L function, W sigma and the data. Okay, and if we wanna maximize this, we should take the derivative, or in this case, the, uh, not Jacobian, but the gradient of L with respect to the parameter that we want to determine, right? So this is just gonna be the 
the uh, the gradient of kind of plugging in this entire expression that we had above. Okay, so just to make my writing life easier, I'm gonna write exp, but this really, the meaning is e to the power of. Okay, over two sigma squared. So this turns out that this is a little bit complicated. Um, we have to use our pro we have to use product rule. So for the product rule, um, maybe, hopefully some of you will remember that if you have um, derivative of f and g multiplied together, it's really actually f prime times g plus g prime times f. So that was for two functions, but it turns out that if you have more functions, it's always going to be the derivative of one of them times all of the other ones without a derivative. And then we add up all the different ways we can do that. So just as an example, like if we have, um, let's say f1 of y, f2 of y, f3 of y, this is just going to be f1 prime of y. So you take the derivative of one of them, leaving all of the others unchanged. And then plus, now you take the derivative of another one of these functions, leaving the others unchanged. F2 prime, okay, F3 of y. And then you do it for all of the combinations. You do it for all the ways this can be done. Okay, so that's a kind of a two variable and three variable case. Now we have now we have n things multiplied together because this is a product from i equal to one to n. So what we're gonna have is we're gonna have n of these, and then for each of them, we're gonna take one of these partial derivatives. Okay, so now I'm gonna not gonna keep writing the the Gaussian distribution. Just gonna write the probability density here. So we take the derivative for, uh, for the ith thing that is being multiplied in here, and then we multiply the rest together. So. So we multiply everything else. So that means everything such that i is not equal to j of p of y j given x j. Okay, so that's how we take the derivative. And the idea is that we should take the derivative or take the gradient set to zero. And then hopefully in the end, we're gonna show that the critical point is indeed gonna be a local or a global maximum. Okay, unfortunately, in this case, we're stuck here. We can't really continue further. So we're gonna be, we're gonna need something, something else. Okay. So, okay, actually we can continue. Yeah, we can continue over here. So this is no good. So what we're gonna do is a very common trick in machine learning. When you want to maximize something or, yeah, when you want to maximize something, you can also maximize the log of that thing. So we want to maximize the likelihood function and that is actually equal, equal to maximizing the log of the likelihood function. And the reason is that log is a non-decreasing function. Actually, log is an increasing function so that it doesn't really affect where the maximum occurs. So log in general, if you have large numbers, it brings down those numbers, but it doesn't change the ordering of the numbers. That's, that's kind of the key. Because it doesn't change the ordering of the argument of log, so logging something will not affect its local maximum. It will not affect where the maximum happens.
So hopefully this can allow us to simplify. So this is a very common trick because very often in machine learning, we have a lot of data points. And with probabilistic models, we always assume that these data points are IID, right? When, whenever you have IID, you're gonna get a bunch of stuff multiplied together. So of course, logging that, logging a product becomes the sum of logs. And the sum is much easier to work with compared to products. Okay, so let's let's just uh, keep going. So let's compute this log likelihood. So this is actually called the log likelihood. So it used to be a product of many things up here, but now we're gonna log everything. So it's gonna be a sum of logs. Uh, I forgot the log. sum of log probabilities. Okay. And now suddenly this becomes a lot easier to work with. So if you wanted to take the gradient of the log likelihood, you, you can kind of see that we no longer need to deal with a very ugly big product. Now it's just going to be taking the gradient term by term. Okay. Then of course the next step would be to actually plug in the PDF and then actually doing the gradient. Okay, so this is what we see on this slide. Instead of taking the argmax of the likelihood function, we're going to take the argmax of the log likelihood function. Oh, by the way, uh, in this class, all the logs are going to be base E, the natural number or Euler's number. Okay, we can do this because log X is strictly increasing. And now um, we can, after we log this product, it becomes a sum of logs, which is really nice because when we take the gradient, we can now take the gradient term by term. Okay, again, gonna take the gradient, set it to zero. That will give us the critical points. Okay, so now let's do that. So now we're gonna write down uh, yeah, let's plug in, we're going to plug in our PDF of the Gaussian. Log 1 over 2 pi sigma squared square root times exponential of minus yi minus w transpose x squared over 2 sigma squared. Okay, so it's still a little bit ugly, of course, but that's that's a, a really cool thing about logs, especially when we have Gaussians, is because the log and the exponentials will cancel out, and then any product becomes a sum. So, so now this is actually just uh, the gradient of so we're gonna cancel the log and exponential first so so log will cancel with the exponential and that gives us yi minus w transpose x squared over 2 sigma squared and then we're gonna minus a log of root 2 pi sigma squared so used to be plus sign here, but then when we log and flip the fraction, we can get a minus sign out. Okay, so hopefully you can, hopefully remember how logs work. Okay, so that's what we have. And now we can kind of go ahead and try to take this derivative. Um, yeah, so actually maybe, 
instead of doing that, it hopefully this is starting to look a bit familiar. Okay, so so basically, let me just simplify things a little bit and only write down the log, log the log likelihood. So the log likelihood is this sum here. So so we're just going to simplify a little bit. Sum of minus y i minus w transpose x squared over two sigma squared. And then the, the second term is actually all the, the same, no matter, it doesn't depend on i, and just n different terms. So we just have n log root two pi sigma squared. Okay, and just do one more step. We can take out any constant that doesn't depend on i here. Okay, there should be an i here. So that's going to be negative 1 over 2 sigma squared, sum from i equal to 1 to, up to n. Of uh, Actually, we already took care of the minus. So yi mi minus w transpose x i squared, and then minus n log 2 pi, uh, 2 pi sigma squared. Okay, so that's basically this slide. So in this slide, um, because we want to find the arc max over W of the log likelihood, let's first simplify the log likelihood. Once we log the likelihood, we just get a sum of log probabilities of each data point. And now we can write down the PDF of the Gaussian, which represents, which, which is the distribution of each data point. Okay, so log cancels with exponential, so that gives us the negative of what was inside the exponential, and then minus log of the thing in the denominator here. Next step, we realize that this whole thing does not depend on i, and there's n of them, so that becomes n log root 2 pi sigma squared, and then in the beginning, um, I guess we can, in, in here, we just took out the negative sign, but it's the same as what I wrote. And then we can also take out the one over two sigma squared as well. Okay, so now that we have a simplified expression for the log likelihood, we can try to find the arc max of this log likelihood. Okay, so that's this slide, and let's work it out a bit more slowly. So W, so again, going to emphasize this is a W that we obtain using the MLE method. So maximum likely, likelihood estimation. This is equal to argmax of W of the log likelihood. And that's equal to argmax of this whole thing that we had. So, so here's what I'll do. I'm going to write down the first term, which is the sum of a bunch of uh, a bunch of terms. So y i minus w transpose x i squared. And then I'm going to ignore the second term, n log, the n log two pi sigma squared term, because that term doesn't depend on w. So if something doesn't depend on W, it's not going to affect what W will maximize the, ex the entire expression. So we only have to consider the first term. Okay, so simplifying a little bit further. Same argument. We can get rid of this uh, 1 over 2 sigma squared because that's just a constant that we're multiplying in front. It does not depend on W. So it is not going to change where what W will maximize the entire expression. And finally, I'll just write down one more step to turn the argmax into an argmin.
of the same thing without a negative sign. I can do this because in general, if you want to maximize some function, okay, try not to use the same letter here. It's the same thing as minimizing the negative of that function. Basically, if you want to maximize some function, you can always just minimize the negative of that function. These two, uh, these two points will occur at the same place. Okay, so hopefully this looks a little familiar because from, from ordinary least squares, we had the loss function being actually exactly the same thing. And of course, we were minimizing this loss, right, in ordinary least squares. So it turns out that with the probabilistic model, we actually got a W estimate that is exactly the same as the ordinary least squares. Okay, to recap a little bit on the slide, we're computing the argmax over W of the log likelihood. And first, we basically plugged in what the log likelihood looked like. On the slides, the next step was actually to remove the negative sign here, make them positive, and then turn the argmax into argmin. And then we removed the n log constant term, and then we removed the 1 over 2 sigma constant term in the front. And then we arrived at something that looks exactly the same as ordinary least squares. So the cool thing here is that when we did ordinary least squares, we, we weren't really thinking about probability at all. All we wanted to do was measure the error of our prediction. We squared it because we wanted to penalize the error we want to penalize any large errors, and we also want to penalize the errors symmetrically, whether the error was above or below the, the observation. It turned out that when we did that, we're actually doing something equivalent to picking this probabilistic model, y equals w transpose x plus sigma epsilon. So that's kind of cool. Okay, so I'll let you guys think about this for, for a little bit. Uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll be back uh, and con to continue our probabilistic interpretation of least uh, of linear regression.
Okay, welcome back. So hopefully that gave you some time to digest. So previously, whether we were doing uh, maximum likelihood estimation or ordinary least squares, um, we treated the parameter w as a fixed parameter. So it is an unknown parameter that we want to um, determine, but, but it was fixed. Um, so, so that's what's called the frequentist approach or the frequentist perspective. Um, there's also another contrasting perspective called the Bayesian perspective. So um, here's the motivation. So suppose we know what values of the parameters are more likely compared to the others. As soon as you, so, so sorry, so remember one example of that was, we know that if W were very large, if some components of W were very large, that's kind of a sign of overfitting. And chances are that the ground truth W would not have any large components. So that's one example of having some prior knowledge about what kind of W would be more likely than the other, than, than, than others. As soon as you start talking about what Ws are likely, what Ws are less likely, well, that's kind of the same thing as saying there must be some probability distribution over W. So in general, the prior belief can be described as a probability distribution over the parameters. And this probability distribution is called the prior probability distribution. So now we're, not, we're no longer treating W or in general parameters as a fixed number, as fixed quantities. We treat them actually as a random variable that follow the prior probability distribution. Okay, again, this is the Bayesian approach or Bayesian statistics. And then if we treat the parameters as fixed, that's known as the frequentist statistics. So now we're actually going to incorporate some of our prior knowledge about W and how perhaps smaller components in W are more likely into, um, into our probabilistic model. Actually, the, I think the probabilistic model is, is the same, is really how we treat, um, how we try to encode our prior knowledge about W. Okay. So let me present this a bit generally first. So we had our probabilistic model. And now to encode our probability distribution, we're going to have what's called P of theta over the parameters of interest theta. In machine learning, a lot of the times we use the letter theta to represent parameters. W is another very common letter. Um, so here I'm using theta to be general because we're already using W for our probabilistic model. Okay. So another way of determining the best parameters is called maximum a posteriori estimation or MAP, M-A-P. And the idea is that we want to find the parameter value that maximizes the conditional probability over the parameters given the observations. Okay, that's a kind of a mouthful, but basically we want to maximize P of theta given the data D. Okay, just to contrast what we were doing before a little bit. So if you look at this likelihood function, this is really L of theta given our data. Okay, sorry, sorry. this is the likelihood function which we, which we wrote this way, that this is not a probability distribution. We have to go back a little bit. Um, over here. So our probability distribution is really the probability of seeing the data given the parameters theta. So P of D given theta, right? But with the max, with the map estimation, maximum a posteriori, we actually have P of theta given D. So, so it's kind of the other way. Um, fortunately, using base rule, we can always flip the conditional because we know what the likelihood is already. So P of theta given D equals to P of theta times P of D given theta over P of D. And um, for the map estimation or map 
estimate of the theta parameters, um, we want to find a theta that maximizes p of theta given d. Okay, so hopefully that also makes sense. So we, we see a bunch of data and we have a probabilistic model. We want to pick the theta um, that, that basically maximizes the probability of p of theta given d. That means that we want to find the most likely parameters given the data set. And the good thing about writing like this, because using the base rule, we know everything. We know p of theta because actually this is something that we define. We define it based on our prior knowledge. And then we also have the likelihood function from before. The denominator doesn't depend on theta, so it's not going to affect um, how we're maximizing over theta. Okay, let's continue. Again, um, let's be a bit more concrete now. So going back to our previous probabilistic model, we had that y given x, w, and sigma is normally distributed with mean of w transpose x and variance sigma squared. And then we can write down the probability density function. So that was a probabilistic model um, with maximum a posteriori estimation. We also need to choose a prior distribution over our parameters. Um, for now, let's just choose this and see what happens. So we're gonna choose um, the probability, so, so now we're gonna view w as a random variable because it has some probability distribution. So the distribution of w given sigma is gonna be a Gaussian with a zero mean and some, some covariance matrix, some some diagonal covariance matrix. So this is sigma squared over lambda, where lambda is just some number. Um, we'll, we'll see what it is later. And then times the identity matrix. So the idea is that with the zero mean prior distribution over W, we're capturing the fact, we're, we're capturing our intuition that smaller values of W, i.e. the Ws that are closer to the origin are gonna be more likely. Okay, so now, um, now that we have chosen a distribution for W, we can write down the PDF. So note that W is actually a vector, right? So this is a multivariate normal distribution. Um, the probability density function is actually a little complicated. It looks like this. One over root two pi to the power of n determinant of this matrix, sigma squared over lambda i, times exponential of a quadratic form. In the quadratic form, um, we, we just have w transpose and w. Well, normally we would subtract the mean, but then the mean is zero. And then our covariance matrix just looks like the inverse of this matrix. Um, in this case, uh, we can actually simplify this a little bit because um, for example, the determinant of a diagonal matrix is just going to be the product of all the diagonal elements. Okay, maybe, yeah, actually maybe it would be good to write this down as well, just to, just to be absolutely clear. Okay, so... So we're going to capture our prior knowledge by assuming that our w is distributed normally with zero mean, meaning that the smaller values of sigma are going to be more likely. And then we have a diagonal covariance. So then we can write down the PDF. So this is equal to one over some, some really ugly thing. Actually, this is uh, to the power of n here, where n is the number of parameters in W. So n is number 
of parameters or the number of components of the vector w. Exponential. So this is the multivariate normal distribution. So we need to construct a quadratic form. Um, actually, we're going to subtract 0 here. OK, so let's not subtract 0 because we don't need to write it down. right? Because 0 is the mean. The covariance matrix is the same as sigma squared over lambda and then the inverse. So inverse of the covariance. OK, so now we can simplify this a bit. The determinant of a diagonal matrix is just going to be the product of all of these diagonal elements. And there's going to be n of these elements. So that's why the determinant can become the same thing, all the diagonal elements times uh, all the diagonal elements raised to the power of n. So then all of them can join the 2 pi to the power of n here. Okay, so one over one over the square root of that. Times exponential. So, so here we have. Here we have. Uh, so here the only thing we need to simplify is really the inverse. So here we have a diagonal matrix, which is really easy to invert. All you have to do is to. Um, take the reciprocal of all the diagonal elements. So actually that turns out to be really, really easy. And also the identity matrix, um, when we multiply by a vector, we don't have really have to write it down. Okay, so let's do everything in one step here. Again, we take the reciprocal of all of the diagonal elements. And then we're going to have W transpose identity W. Okay, so so this part is just the same as W transpose W, which is equal to the two norm squared of W. Okay, and that's what we have on the slides over here. So now given these two distributions, we would like to compute the posteriori distribution, this one. And then we would like to choose the parameters that maximizes that distribution. So then we're going to do it over here. OK, so again, this is a bit of a math. Um, so we're going to do it slowly. OK, so, so now we're going to estimate w. But then this estimation, we're going to call it the MAP estimation. So this is equal to arg max over w of probability of theta given our given d the data. For us, uh, for us, well, let me just erase this because for us the parameters are actually just w. So given D and then Sigma. Okay. So to do the arg max, again, we can already see some really terrible math here because again, we're going to end up, one of the terms is going to be a likelihood term. And then that term will have many, many probabilities multiplied together. So we may as well learn our lesson from the beginning and and maximize the log probability instead. Okay. So now we can apply base rule because we don't really know what this is. So we need to compute it from something that we know. So to do that, we're going to use base rule. So base rule, you basically swap what's being conditioned Everything here is going to be conditioned on sigma, so that's not really going to go anywhere. 
so in your assignment you you're proving this right you can you're proving the conditional version of the base rule basically if everything is given the same thing you ignore the thing that is that appears in every term okay so the log is now starting to be useful even before we write down the log likelihood even before we write down the likelihood because we have a product of a few things so then now this becomes the log of each of them individually okay so now log w uh, probability of w given sigma minus log okay i keep forgetting the probability log probability of d given sigma okay it turns out that we don't really need this the last term because the last term does not depend on w at all I'm going to write this step. The last term does not depend on w, so we can drop it. But then we're going to keep the other two terms, which do depend on w. OK, so now we have one term that is the likelihood. So this is something that we already uh, saw before. And then the second term, this is the prior, the prior distribution. OK, so. Yeah, so let, let's write it down. Let's just continue simplifying. So this is going to be log of probability of seeing y1, y2, up to yn, the number of data points, given our input observations, x1 up to xn. And of course, given our parameters as well. Okay, plus log of our prior distribu distribution, P of W given sigma. Okay. I guess we have already seen this before. Using independence, we can turn this really big probability distribution, the likelihood function, into a product of P of yi given xi, w, and sigma. And of course, we still have log of the prior distribution. OK, and finally, the log will allow us to turn the product into a sum. So it's going to be sum from i equal to 1 to n of the log p of, y, uh, p of y i given x i w and sigma plus log of the pr uh, prior distribution. It's, this is basically working on the argmax expression until we get something that we can um, that, that is basically a summation of a bunch of stuff and now if you return to the slides that's basically what we have here so we want to do the argmax over w of our po posterior distribution learning our lesson from before let's do the log first and then we use the Bayes ru rule to expand out the um, the posterior distribution so that's going to be prior times uh, prior distribution times the likelihood over this normalizing constant which which then after we log it we realize that we can actually throw that out because it doesn't even depend on w for the remaining of the steps we were simply working on the likelihood function just like before and eventually we got the summation, the sum of the log probabilities for each data point.
Okay, so not really done yet because the next step will be to plug in um, the probability density functions for each of these expressions. Okay, so a little ugly, of course, but uh, it's actually not that complicated if we do it step by step. Okay, so I'm gonna need a little bit more room here. So R max over W of the sum i equal to one to n of log. Um, so this one was the it was a normal distribution for the data points for the likelihood function. So this one, uh, this yeah, this was the yeah, this was the probabilistic model that we had. So W has no index. W is just W. W transpose X I. All of that squared over two sigma squared. Plus, and now we can write down um, basically we can write down this one. 1 over root 2 pi sigma over lambda to the power of n and then exponential of minus uh, minus lambda over 2 sigma squared 2 norm of w squared all of that okay so hopefully you're seeing something a little familiar just like before, but let's keep going a little bit. So first, we're going to do the same trick where this term doesn't depend, doesn't really depend on i, so we can pull it out. So we're gonna first split the log and then pull it out. So sp splitting the log first. So that becomes a negative log of root two pi sigma squared. And then the log and exponential cancel. So we only get the thing inside the exponent. Okay, we used to be, we were done before, but now we have two more terms. So minus log of the square root for our prior distribution. Sorry, this should be to the power of n here. And then log cancels with exp. I guess uh, I guess I was missing a log over here. <laughs> okay. So this log cancels with the exp. So then you just get the stuff inside. Minus lambda over two sigma squared, two norm of w squared. Okay, so hopefully you can see that because we're maximizing over w, we can remove the terms which are independent of w. Uh, just putting the brackets here to kind of to make, make it clear what the sum like what is inside a sum. So now we're going to remove some stuff like the log can go away. The log, basically log of the constant, constant terms can go away. They don't depend on W. So this is argmax of negative sum of from I equal to one to N of this, let's do, because we have a negative, negative sign everywhere, let's just put a negative sign in front. Squared over two sigma squared plus lambda over two sigma squared. So now you can kind of see that why we chose the, why we chose our prior distribution to have sigma squared over lambda as the, um, as the covariance. 
So that's basically what we're doing on this slide. We plug in the probability density function for our prior distribution. And then we plug in the likelihood probability distribution as well. Using the same log tricks, um, we basically cancel out the exp. And then we have some constant, uh, constant terms inside the log as well, just like before. We throw them away, and this is what we get at the end. So we're almost done. One more page. And we're going to continue uh, writing it down as well. Okay, so now maybe you can see the trick, right? So we're going to turn the argmax into an argmin and then lose the negative sign. At the same time, let's just, we may as well get rid of the two sigma squared because um, it's just a constant in front, right? It doesn't really affect what w minimizes the expression. Okay, and hopefully this will look very familiar to you. Um, this is actually the same as minimizing minimizing the ridge regression loss. Ridge regression loss. Okay, so that's kind of interesting as well. So by introducing a prior distribution, it um, where we're kind of saying that the distribution should be zero mean. Okay, let's go back to the notes. Okay, actually, let's just go over this uh, math, finish the math first, right? Um, so argmax of the previous page, um, kind of factor out the two sigma, one over two sigma squared, get rid of the negative, and then it becomes argmin, and then get rid of this thing, one over two sigma squared. And then what we get is something that is exactly the same as the loss function in ridge regression. So what that means is that um, if we choose a prior distribution of this form, where we have a zero mean distribution and some diagonal covariance, this is basically saying that the different components of W are independent from each other. That's, uh, that's what the covariance is saying. And the zero mean is saying that smaller values of W are more likely. So smaller norms of W are more likely. So given this prior distribution, it turns out that um, the best W is actually the same as the one that we would get from ridge regression. So that gives us a probabilistic interpretation of ridge regression. This is a really important point, so let's recap. Let's go back to ordinary least squares versus ridge regression. So this was the deterministic interpretation of linear regression. Our model was y equals w transpose x, and we wanted to determine the parameters w. In ordinary least squares, our loss function was the sum of the squared loss of every data point, or the sum of the squared vertical uh, error of every data point. And that could be that could have been written as the two norm square two norm of y minus matrix xw. And the optimal parameters were given by this uh, expression, um, w star equals argmin over w of the loss, which is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. Okay, so I, sh I need to write uh, to be completely correct, I need to write an uh, argument here. Okay, no, no that's, that's actually correct, sorry. So w equals, w star equals the argmin, which equals to this expression. On the side of ridge regression, we had a loss function where we added a regularization term. And that term was plus lambda w, two norm of w squared. Again, we had a matrix uh, form for the loss as well. And when we minimize the loss, we got x transpose x plus lambda i inverse x transpose y. That was the 
optimal parameters for rate regression. Up to now, there's no, um, there's no probability at all. Everything is deterministic. The intuition is basically minimize squared error for each data point. And then for the case of rich regression, penalize large values, large components of W using the two norm. With the probabilistic interpretation, we had a probabilistic model where the probability distribution of Y given X, W, and Sigma, um, it was, uh, we, we said that that was distributed normally with the mean of W transpose X and the variance of Sigma squared. We also had a prior distribution um, w given sigma was distributed normally with a mean of zero and sigma over lambda i covariance. So this was basically again saying smaller values of w are more likely and furthermore the different components of w are independent from each other from the diagonal covariance. The parameters we would like to determine are w and then we also had nuisance parameters sigma. With the probabilistic model, we had two ways of estimating W. One of them is the maximum likelihood, which turns out to be um, the same thing as minimizing the loss function of ordinary least squares. And of course, that means that the WMLE is actually the same as, uh, as before in ordinary least squares. For the map estimate or maximum a posteriori estimate, um, it turned out that by incorporating the prior, we actually just end up getting the same regularization term, um, lambda 2 norm squared of w. Um, by maximizing, so maximizing the posterior distribution turned out to be the same thing as minimizing the same loss function as ridge regression. Of course, the, the w map is going to be the same as the w star over here. So x transpose x plus lambda i inverse x transpose y. Okay, so with all of that math, both for the deterministic case and the probabilistic case, here are the takeaways. So in general, there are deep connections between deterministic and probabilistic formulations of machine learning methods. So many methods, including least squares, as you have seen, have both deterministic and probabilistic interpretations. Usually the primary loss function, so the, the primary loss function is related to the likelihood. So the probability of seeing the data given our parameters and regularizers are related to the prior distribution of the parameters. In the case um, of least squares, we have seen that square losses so whenever we have square losses like this, that's related to univariate Gaussian observation noise. Right, so what does that mean? So, so this is basically observation noise. The, when the data was generated, it was W transpose X, but then there was some noise, right? If the noise is Gaussian, um, if the noise was basically a uh, one dimensional Gaussian, uh, then that corresponds to square losses when we take the deterministic case. And then when we have L2, um, when we have L2 losses, so that would be, this, this would be for like a multi, uh, multivariate input. It would be related to isotropic Gaussian observation noise. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit about full Bayesian inference. We're going to start by talking about the maximum a posteriori estimate first. So remember when we did the map estimation, um, basically uh, we said that, okay, we want to maximize the probability of theta or our parameters given the data that we see. Right? And that was given by the base rule. And for map, we actually picked a single set of parameters that maximized the posterior distribution. Um, but Bayesian inference, in contrast, uh, 
we'll try to compute the entire distribution probability of theta given d. So what that means is that full Bayesian inference will not only produce a single value for the parameter. So this is called a point estimate. Whenever you produce a single value for the parameter, that's called a point estimate. Um, but uh, full Bayesian inference will give us a full distribution over the possible parameter values. So remember back here when we said, um, when we said, okay, maybe we have some prior knowledge about our, about our parameters. And prior knowledge is basically uh, saying, okay, some values are more likely, some values are less likely. Whenever you start talking about less likely, more likely, suddenly you have a distribution over parameters. So full Bayesian inference is saying, based on the data that we see, what is the probability distribution over the parameters? Okay, so that's, so not just the prior, but after seeing the data, what what is the distribution over the parameters? So, um, so of course, uh, from a Bayesian perspective, this would be ideal, right? Because you don't just get one estimate. This is basically like finding the maximum of this distribution. But you get way more information. For example, how spread out is this distribution? Um, unfortunately, this is actually a very, very challenging to do. Um, usually, it's actually intractable, basically for everything. Um, so then we typically need to rely on sampling based methods or approximation methods. In your assignment, uh, actually assignment two, you'll be looking at one special case where you can actually compute this distribution. Okay, so given that this is very hard to compute and this is much easier as we have seen, when would this be a pretty good thing to do? So to figure that out, we can talk about modes. So the mode of a probability distribution is a maximum, a local maximum of the probability density function. In the case of a discrete distribution, it's just the, the values at which the probability mass function is the highest. So different probability distributions um, could have either a single mode or many different modes. So a probability distribution with a single mode, like a Gaussian distribution, for example, um, that's called unimodal. Some distributions have two modes, that's called bimodal, and some other distributions have multi -mo multiple modes, that's called a multimodal distribution. So here's a, an example of a multimodal distribution. So this is actually a mixture of K Gaussian distributions. So then you, you can see many different peaks, many different local maximum. Um, so that's uh, many modes. So basically to compare full Bayesian inf inference versus map, we basically look at the modes. So whenever the posterior distribution is unimodal, that means that there's one parameter value that is the most likely or the most plausible given the data and the map estimate finds this value. So usually in this case, the map estimate would capture the most important information of the posterior. It doesn't capture all the information because there's still the spread of the distribution, for example, but it does capture the most important information pretty well. On the other hand, when the posterior distribution is multimodal, meaning that there could be many peaks, then the map estimate will just give you one of these local maximum. So actually then you're losing a lot of information because you don't really know where the other local maximum are. So in this case, it would be preferable to do full Bayesian in, uh, inference. Okay, it's a little a quick word about terminology. So. So here we're talking about Bayesian, inf Bayesian inference and here Bayesian inference means determining the probability distribution P of theta given D.
So this sounds like training, right? When we talk about Bayesian inference, it sounds like training because we're using the observed data to infer something unknown, like the unknown parameters. Um, but a lot of times, you maybe some of you may have heard the term inf inference being used to mean testing or making predictions, as opposed to training, which is what we're doing. So actually, the, the, the term inference, the meaning of it depends on the context. So for example, when we say inference time or training and inference, in this case, inference means testing. When we talk about Bayesian inference or probabilistic inference or parameter inference, that means training, right? So that's what we're doing here. We're inferring theta, either using map, or maybe we're inferring the probability distribution over theta using full Bayesian inference. So this is training because we're determining the parameter. And sometimes people might say inference procedure. So that's just completely ambiguous. We don't really know what that means. So in this class, we're going to try to stick with training and testing um, to make sure that there's no confusion. But in other, in other uh, places, for example, if you take another machine learning course, a more advanced one, or maybe you read some papers, then um, you need to determine the meaning of inference based on context. Okay, so actually, maybe just one last thing before we end today. So more terminology, a priori versus a posteriori. So you might see these words quite a bit. So these are actually Latin words. A priori means from the earlier. So the meaning is prior knowledge that we have seen, sorry, the prior knowledge that we have before seeing the data. So this is uh, one example of this is uh, when we assume some prior distribution over our parameters. So this distribution we decided on before seeing any data. A posteriori means from the later. So that means the knowledge that we obtain after seeing the data. So an example here was, an example that we saw was the posterior distribution. So this is a posterior distribution which we obtained from the prior, so not seeing data, and then combined with the information from the data in the form of the likelihood function. So that gives us the posterior distribution. So some examples of using these words, you will see these in papers as well. Um, not just papers, even everyday, everyday English, you will see these words. So um, for example, the degree of the polynomial is not known a priori. So that means that we don't know what the degree of the polynomial should be, before we see the data. Another example, the, the a posteriori estimates are mostly concentrated around 0.5. So what that means is that after seeing the data, most of the estimates are near 0.5. Okay, so just uh, some terminology that you guys should, uh, you guys should know. Um, I guess with, with this course, there's a lot of different terms like maximum likelihood, maximum a posteriori, right? So um, if you're having trouble remembering everything, I even recommend maybe listing a lot of the keywords that we covered and then you guys can go through them from time to time to make sure that you, you remember all of them. Okay, so that's good for today. So I'll see you guys on Thursday.